Good evening. It's good to be here with you all tonight. We'll go ahead and get started. I have a few announcements and some prayer requests that I want to make note of uh, before we do get started. Uh, Dave Sweeney had hip replacement surgery this m morning. Everything went well, and he'll hopefully get to go home tomorrow. And also, uh, it was announced on uh, Sunday about Dan Winkler, uh, who is Daniel Winkler's father. Um, he got good news from his biopsy results today. All cancer uh, is contained in his colon. Lymph nodes are clear, and he hopes to go home tomorrow, which is certainly very good news uh, about Dan Winkler. Uh, as far as announcements go, uh, our annual Valentine's banquet will be this Saturday. Uh, we ask our youth group members to arrive at noon on Saturday to begin preparing food and decorating for the skit. Uh, we will be delivering food to our senior members and broadcasting the skit uh, by uh, Southern Hills website and our Facebook page as well. Uh, Equip is also coming up and that'll be February 12th and the 13th. Uh, we'll meet at the building at 4.30 p.m. on Friday and we'll finish by 2.30 p.m. on Saturday. Now please wear warm, comfortable clothing, bring your mask, your Bible, and a great attitude. Uh, that's all that I have for our announcements. Again, I, I forgot to mention, obviously, uh, we know about um, we have several members who have been affected by COVID. I continue to pray for them as well. Uh, the list continues to grow of, of people who have been impacted by that virus. And so we certainly want to keep uh, them in our prayers. If you would like a list, there is the announcement sheet uh, in the back uh, of, of people who are on the list. That's all that I have for our announcements and prayer requests uh, at this time. Let's go ahead and begin with a prayer. Our dear Father, we are thankful to you for everything you bless us with. Our God, we're thankful for this opportunity we have to be together tonight. So we just finished talking about those who are in need of prayers. We certainly want to ask you, God, and, and, and request that you would um, be with all of our members uh, who have been impacted by the virus that's going around. Uh, we know there's varying degrees of it, but we ask that you be with them all. Uh, we pray that you be with uh, Dave Sweeney and, and help him to recover from the surgery he had. We're thankful for the successful surgery and, and pray that uh, he would recover well and quickly from it. God, we're thankful for the good news of our brother Dan Winkler. We are uh, mindful of him and, and know that uh, there is still uh, a road ahead of him. Uh, but we are thankful for the good news and pray that you be with him throughout the process of uh, dealing with all the, the medical doctors and, and all that needs uh, to take place and go into uh, the cancer that he has. God, we are thankful for this time where we could be together tonight. We're thankful for the opportunity to study and to learn. Uh, we pray that our being together will be good for uh, each of us, that we'll be encouraged by it, that we'll learn from our uh, gathering together. And certainly we want to ask that uh, you be glorified by our being here. We want to set our hearts and minds on the worship that we offer to you. And God, express to you our love and gratitude, our appreciation and thanksgiving. Our God, we love you. And it's to your son that we pray. Amen. Our first song this evening is number 990.
bow together. Great God and Father in heaven, we are grateful for <clears throat> this opportunity to be in this place this evening, this opportunity to pause, to think of the things that you've done for us, think of the ways that you've blessed us, and to give you praise and glory and honor that you deserve. We pray that you would be with us as we go throughout this evening, be with those that are teaching our children, be with those uh, who are listening to those teachers. And we also ask that you would be with Brother Garrett as he brings us a lesson this evening. We're thankful, Father, for what appears to be many people in this congregation recovering from coronavirus. We pray for those who are still struggling with it. We pray that you would continue to bless this congregation's health. And we pray that you continue to bless us as we try to serve others as we continue to battle this pandemic, we ask that you would be with the church here at Southern Hills, but also universal, that we might understand our changes that we must see, but also not stop doing what we are called to do as Christians and look for ways to serve and to be the light on the hill that we are called to be, that we might bring others to you. Thankful again for Brother Winkler, thankful for the good news on that. We pray that you'll continue to bless him and his family. And we're also grateful that Brother Sweeney is out of surgery. We pray that you continue to bless his recovery in that. Be with us not only here this evening, Father, but as we go from here, may we use the outside of here as our mission field that we might not just be an example, but also find ways to talk to those who are in front of us, to serve those who are in front of us and to give the good news to those who are in front of us. We're thankful for your son, Jesus, through which this prayer is possible and our salvation is possible through obedience. It's through him we pray, amen. The song after the lesson this evening is number 9595. If you use your book, please mark that. And before Brother Garrett preaches to us, we'll sing number five, the first two verses of number five. Let's stand for this song. <clears throat> there are things I can try.
We're going to go from down here again this, this evening. Um, if you have your Bibles, go ho- ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 26. Uh, you probably are aware at this point is that we're continuing a study that has been going on, I think, since September or October about the marvelous things of Jesus. And we're going to continue that. Um, the, the, co- the, the classes we, we were doing were going to end in December. And when they decided to extend, in a sense, this quarter out, uh, kind of the, the path we've been taking since then is kind of walking towards, in a sense, the cross of Jesus. Okay, so we talked about his triumphal entry. Last week we talked about what is a very important event in the life of Jesus, that is his institution of the Lord's Supper and and what all uh, was entailed in that. And we're going to talk about today specifically the betrayal of Jesus. Now, I I don't have a PowerPoint. One of the reasons I don't have a PowerPoint is because when I was given the topic that I was supposed to address tonight, there's 56 verses in it. And I thought, I'm, it's just hard. I'm not going to be able to cover every one of them. And so I'm going to be jumping around a little bit in, in the chapter. And it's just easier if you just have your Bibles open and I'll just kind of tell you what verse to look at. Uh, but we'll be in Matthew chapter 26 tonight. Uh, we're going to kind of study through verse 56. But again, we're not going to read every verse in here. Um, it, it is somewhat important to note that what's been going on before this, uh, the book of Matthew is unique in the Gospels in in the sense that it's written for the purpose of convincing the Jew that Jesus is the Messiah. Okay, and so when you read, for example, on Sunday mornings, we're going through Luke, and, and Luke is writing to a more Gentile audience, and, and Matthew's writing to a more Jewish audience, and so they're telling the same things, or a lot of the same things, but, but if you're watching carefully, you'll notice that Matthew does some things a little bit different, because he's trying to convince a different group of people. One of the things that Matthew does that Luke doesn't necessarily do, is he hones in on this idea that the, the Jews had about. Jesus is that he would be a teacher of the people, okay? And the Jews kind of had this understanding that the Messiah would come, and he would be someone who led, like he'd be like a prophet in a sense, like teaching and, and sharing the word of God with the people. Well, so one of the things Matthew does is he has these long speech sections of Jesus, Right? Jesus talks longer in Matthew than he does in the other gospel accounts. That's why you have the Sermon on the Mount, like three chapters of just red letters in your Bible. Right? And, and, and you don't get that in a lot of other places. Luke talks about the, the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount also, but you know, he, he does about half of a chapter of it. Right? And so Jesus and, and Matthew just has these long speech sections. Well, one of them came right before this. So, like, if you're looking through your Bible, you'll notice a lot of red letters in Matthew chapter 25 and 24 and 23. And tw- like, like, it's just a lot of Jesus teaching. And, and so, like, we're reading these teachings of Jesus. And then we get to Matthew 26 and verse 1. And it says, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples. And it's almost like this indication that Jesus has been this teacher throughout all of his life. But that teaching's about to stop. His teachings were finished to the people. Now, you and I know he still has some intimate moments with his apostles, that that he's going to teach them some things. But as far as Jesus' ministry, as far as him going out and teaching the people, it's done. All right, so he said to his disciples at, at this moment, you know that after two days the Passover is coming. And the Son of Man will be delivered to be crucified. Now, again, Jesus has already hinted at this several times with his disciples, uh, and and they had a hard time with it, right? They didn't want to believe it. And I think we'll even see today, they still, in a sense, feel like they could fight that off. Like, like, Like they can keep this from happening. But Jesus has been saying, no, I'm going to be crucified. Right? In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus told Uh, Peter, that very thing, or his apostles. And that's when Peter said to him, no, Lord, this should never happen to you. And and, and we've talked about it actually in in fairly recent weeks where Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're not mindful of the things of man or the things of God, but the things of men. 
right? And so like when Jesus predicted his crucifixion, this is really something that the apostles just, in a sense, rebuffed. They went against because it wasn't their idea of who the Messiah was supposed to be. And so when Jesus tells them, basically, now it's time. Like we're going to do this and we're going to do this now. Um, We're told in verse 3, Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest. Interestingly, the word palace there um, probably just has to do with the whole um, house where the chief priest lived. That same word is translated as a courtyard in in, in verse 58 of the same chapter, right? And so it's it's not, don't don't think of it like this this palace, like a huge castle. Just think of it as, as his home, right? And it includes a courtyard and things along those lines. And so they're at the home of uh, this chief priest. Uh, his name was Caiaphas. And, and while they were together, it says in verse 4, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. Like this is, this is supposed to be like the rel- religious leaders of the day. And, and they're plotting together. To, to kind of secretly kill a man, right? It's not something that, you know, when, when you read through the law, there were certain things that were um, worthy of death and the punishment was death, but these guys weren't really concerned as much about following the law. They were, they were more concerned with like, let's be secretive. Let's get this thing done and, and just, just get, in a sense, this problem off of our backs, Interestingly, and I, I found this interesting, verse 4 says uh, they plotted in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. And I thought, what's that word stealth mean? Like, what is he talking about there? And so I looked it up, and the word that's used there is uh, dolos. And that word is used 11 times in the New Testament. Nine of those times is translated deceit. They, they weren't being honest. They didn't care the means by which they did it. They were being deceitful. It's like this picture of like you, you sneaking around and like, like just, just you know, doing anything you can to get this done. And that's really what our study is about tonight. Because you're going to have a man who betrays him. And, and what's interesting, we're not going to be able to, we're going to jump on down to verse 14. Um, in between this section, there's this really neat account, and we don't have time to talk about it, but this really neat account where this woman has some, some costly, uh, like, like oils and perfumes, and, and she uses it on Jesus. And some of the disciples, interestingly, kind of, kind of spurned that thing. And oh, this could have been sold and given to somebody who was poor. And, and Jesus basically was making the point, look, the poor you'll always have, but look, I'm about to die. She did a beautiful thing for me. And so don't, don't rebuke her for that. Well, we get to verse 14, and, and he's been in conversation with the disciples. He says, then one of the 12, whose name was Judas Iscariot. Now, just pause right there. And, and, and this, is, this is one of the things that, like, I, I think sometimes it's neat to try to think about the people who first read Matthew. Like, you guys know Judas Iscariot, right? I mean, we've, I've, I've heard about him since the time I was young. I've known the name and all that. But it's so like, we know what he did. But, but if, you're, if you're just picking up this scroll, right, Matthew, and, and you're reading it for the first time, you might remember that back in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 4, he mentions Judas Iscariot. And he says, he's the one who betrayed. And so, like, if you're reading this, you're thinking, you're waiting for that name to come up. Right, there's recently, I just watched a movie fairly recently where like the very first scene of the movie was telling you the guy who killed like the main star of it. And then like you're watching this thing and and it almost gets to the point where you kind of forget that. You're just watching the movie and then it starts to happen. You're like, oh yeah, he said that about that. And, And I kind of think of it that way. Like at the very beginning of this book, or not the very beginning, chapter 10, he mentions Judas Iscariot is the one who kills Jesus or betrays him. And then we just go on. And now he brings that name up again. And he brings the name up again when he says, look, they're, they're, they're plotting to kill Jesus. And so you should think, oh, this Judas, something's going to happen with him. Well, 
something does happen with him. We're told that Judas went to the chief priest and said, what will you give me if I deliver him over to you? That's, I don't know if you've spent much, and, and I don't know if it's, it's really has great point to it because oh, we don't know, but I've often wondered what's going on in his mind. What would take him to that point? And we don't know. I mean, we, we know it's not good. Right? We, we know it's deceitful. We know it's wrong. But I can't imagine getting to a point where, like, you've walked with this Jesus all your life. I mean, not all your life. It's the last three years of your life. And, and you've seen him do incredible things. Absolutely incredible. Heal the blind. Heal the cripple. Raise the dead. Feed thousands with, you know, just a little bit of, I mean, just all these incredible things. I've heard some people suggest that, that Judas was upset because he had imagined that Jesus was going to build like an earthly kingdom, and he's starting to realize that Jesus isn't going to. I've heard some people suggest maybe it's possible that, um, you know, he, he's seen Jesus get himself out of some precarious situations before. And so he thought, well, he'll do the same thing and I'll make some money out of it, right? I mean, and, and so like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know, but whatever it is, like something has hardened this guy's heart. And, and it's actually interesting because scripture in one place says that like Satan entered into the heart of him. What will you give me? <laughs> uh, What's it worth? Matthew chapter 16, I believe it's verse 28. The question's asked, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what would, what would a man give in exchange for his soul? It's an interesting question. I think, honestly, you, I don't know if you've heard me say this before. I think it's a question we should ask ourselves every now and then. Like, what would I give for my soul? Like, what, what amount of money is there that, that I would give in exchange for my soul? And hopefully the answer that, that each of us would have is, well, there's, there's, there's no amount of money that I would give in exchange for my soul. For Judas... 30 pieces of silver. Now, if, if a piece of silver was in reference to a shekel, which a lot of people think that it is, that's about four months' wages. Which, I mean, that's, a, I guess, pretty pretty good amount of money. Um, but betray the Lord... It says, and they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. Well, we're, we've already been told uh, in verse 2 that the Passover was coming up. And in the following verses, we'll see that, that they're gathering together for the Passover feast um, or the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We talked about that last week. We get down to verse 20. It says, when it was evening... He reclined at a table with the 12. So Judas is still there. Judas knows what he's done and what he's about to do, but he's still there with Jesus. It says, and as they were sitting, he, that is Jesus said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, is it I, Lord? And he answered, he who dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The son of man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would, have been, or it would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, is it I, rabbi? He said to him, 
uh, you have said so. There's a couple interesting things about this section that we've just read, uh, verses 20 through 25. Uh, I think the first thing that really sticks out to me is, is the change and, and the questions that is asked. All right, so, so Jesus predicts that one of them will betray. And you might remember the disciples asked, is it I, Lord? And we've talked pretty extensively about that word Lord here in, in the not too um, distant past, I guess. Uh, the word Lord means ultimate authority. All right, the, the, the word Lord means like, like you are my ruler, like you are my authority figure. You tell me how to live and I will live that way. And, and the disciples recognize Jesus as Lord. But you might recognize that Judas, when he asked the question, asked something a little bit different. He said, is it I, rabbi? The word rabbi means teacher. And Jesus was often called teacher. But it's interesting to me that that the the 11, it seems, were saying, Lord. And Judas is saying, teacher. I, th- I think at this point, it seems like they have a different understanding of, of who he is. Also interesting to me, that Jesus obviously at this point knows who it is who would betray him. You know, and, and, I, and I've often thought of the point, and, and again, like, it, it, it's fascinating to me that even as you keep on reading, like, like, Jesus is here, like, having this really intimate moment with his apostles, like, moments, like, hours before his death or his arrest, and, and he's having this moment with them, and he knows that one of these guys is going to betray him. And I've often wondered, like, why didn't Jesus just, just kick him out before it ever started? Right? That's, that's probably, like, I don't know, honestly, like, if I'm being honest, probably how I would have handled the situation if I knew that someone in my group was about to betray me. Like, I, I'm not even sitting down to eat with the guy. Like I, like, I want him out before I have this moment. But then I think about it even more, and I realize Jesus knew who this man was before he ever even called them to follow him. And that's fascinating to me. That Jesus has walked with this man and talked with this man and befriended this man and loved this man who would betray him. I've often said, that within, within this verse, verse 24 specifically, is one of the saddest verses I think I, I, you could possibly read about something. He says at the end of verse 24, it would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Now, can you imagine that being said about your existence? about your life. Like, like I, I like to think that my life will mean something. I like to think that, you know, this world will be maybe just a smidge better because I've been here or that I could do something. But, but to think that you could sum up his existence by saying it would have been better if he had never been born. It's just a tragic thing. It's just sad. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is. And, and, and I realize this as, as we're going through it, you pointed out, like, he's not the only one who this could ever be said about. It's been said before. And, and like, my prayer is that, like, I will never live in a way to where it could be said, it'd be better if he'd not been born. Well, interestingly, verse 26, we're not going to keep reading. We're going to have to skip a little bit. But in verse 26, Jesus took the bread, blessed it, gave thanks, and he instituted what we often call the Lord's Supper, um, or what we know as the Lord's Supper. But once again, 
even after saying, yeah, it's you, Judas remains. Eventually, Judas will leave. Seems on his own initiative. And Jesus takes his disciples and he goes up on the Mount of Olives and he spends some time in prayer. And, and, and you probably are aware of this situation that happens with his disciples where he goes off to pray and they fall asleep and they're supposed to be watching because Jesus is telling them like they're, they're about to come get me. You watch. And, and Jesus goes to pray and he comes back and he finds them sleeping. He tells them, look, I, you know, and he goes away and you kind of have this back and forth type thing going on with the apostles. When you get to verse 45, it says he came to his disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. Like right now, it's, it's late. You can understand why they're falling asleep. It's hard to stay up all night. Uh, they've been uh, through a lot and, and been very emotional. And so they're probably very tired and they keep falling asleep. But Jesus says, like, you could sleep on later on. Right now, he says, see, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Interestingly, because Jesus is dying, being crucified to take away the sin of sinners. And yet the very people that Jesus is saving, they are the ones killing him and about to kill him. Also interesting that what we've seen is that the people who are plotting to kill Jesus, um, the chief priests and the, the scribes and the Pharisees and these kind of these religious rule, the elders of the people, um, they probably don't like being referred to that way, but that's who they are. They're violating the will of God. He says, being betrayed into the hand of sinners. He says in verse 46, rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the 12, and with him a great crowd and swords and clubs, or with swords and clubs, and the chief priests and the elders of the people. And we'll just pause right there. Like, and, and Jesus will point this out in a moment. Kind of interesting that they come to Jesus with such, you know, a, a group, right? Such a, 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 an army, uh, people who are prepared, it, it doesn't seem prepared to just arrest a man. Um, but, but maybe they're thinking revolt. Uh, Jesus, well, it, it's, it's almost confusing. Jesus would even ask, why would they do it in this way? And, and we'll get to that in just a moment. It says in verse 48, now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one uh, I kiss, I will kiss, is the man sees him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, greeting rabbi, and he kissed him. The word kiss is interesting. It's a compound word. Uh, you have kata at the beginning and phileo at, at the end. And, and so phileo is like a word for love. It expresses love. And it's very interesting that the person betraying Jesus into the hands of the people who would crucify him in a heinous way extends to him and, 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 and betrays him with an act of love. Jesus said to him, friend, do what you came to do. Now, there's a couple of different words in, in the Greek language that can be translated as friend. Uh, the word Jesus uses here is hetairos. Now, that word's not used a lot, and it's really more like a companion. Not a close friend. He was a man Jesus knew. But he's, he's made it to where he's no longer a, a, like a, a phylos of Jesus. He's no longer a friend. But he says, 
friend, do what you came to do. And then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Now, interesting, a couple of different things. First of all, we're not told who did this. John is the only gospel writer who tells us who did this. Probably, uh, it seems as if because John is the latest writer, right? And so he wrote many, many years after Matthew and Mark and Luke wrote. And, and so, like, if, if word gets out that, that Peter drew his sword and, and started to fight with, with a person like that, like, he could be in some serious legal trouble. And so it seems as if maybe that's why Matthew just says, one of them. Like, don't, don't worry about it. It's like, I'm not going to like, tell on my friend here. Like, like he, he, he just kind of, hey, and, and John, many years later, like, after, like, Peter's dead, and he's like, oh, yeah, it was Peter. Uh, you know, and, and so, it's, you know, it's, he, he seems to just be a little more loose with the information. Uh, it says, and behold, one of those, that is Peter, who were with Jesus, stretched out his hand, drew a sword, and struck the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. Now, Again, and, and, and we've talked about this in, in, in previous classes, what they're expecting of Jesus is, is, is a conquering, right? A war, and like, Jesus has told them, they're going to crucify me, they're going to crucify me, and they're like, they're not accepting it. Peter is thinking, okay, we've, like, if, if we're going to conquer Rome, like, if we're go- like, this is the moment, this is where the war starts, this is where we begin the fight. It says, and Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Actually, I believe it's John's account that tells us Jesus actually healed the man. Like, Jesus is like, we're not fighting. Like, look, you're, you keep thinking of this kingdom as like this, this, this earthly kingdom and we're going to, con- but like, w- that just, war just causes more war. Fighting just causes more fighting. You want to live by a sword, you're going to die by a sword, right? And so like, you're, you're, you're wanting, this is not what I'm doing and, and you're not understanding it. And, and this, I, I think this is, this is hard for the disciples to grab on. They don't know what to do because all along they've been thinking like, I'm willing to fight and die for you. And I believe they were, they were literally willing to do that. But it's a whole different thing to say, I'll fight for you and die for you than to say, I'll let someone kill me for you. What Jesus was doing, and this will be highlighted here in the next couple of verses, is allowing himself to be killed. Jesus actually goes on and says this. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? Like, if Jesus wanted to fight... Like, they brought their clubs and their swords, right? I mean, but like, if Jesus wanted to fight, they don't stand a chance. Like, the creator of the world isn't worried about you holding a sword, right? I mean, like, like he, he, he can handle it. And then he's not worried about, like, Jesus is like, look, Simon, put your sword away. Like, if I was wanting to fight this thing, it's not even a fight. But that's not what I'm here for. As a matter of fact, he would then ask this question, but how then should the scripture be fulfilled? That it must be so. Right? So if, if, we, if I just call these angels and they just go and they wipe them all out and like I'm set free and I don't like, then 
than the scripture which talks about like that I'm come to die for the world and like the the through one the all the way back to Genesis through the seed of Abraham all nations of the earth shall be blessed and all the passages that speak of Christ and even his suffering like like if if I just destroy all these people like then the will of God won't be done then the scripture won't be fulfilled. Uh, and ultimately, your sin won't be taken care of. Verse 55 says, At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come against me as a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Like, we talked about it. Jesus is. Uh, I, I don't want to say perplexed. He understands the situation. He knows what's going on. But, but he's asking a question kind of like this, like, why are you doing it in this way? And again, like Jesus often asks questions. I, I think the reason he did, like he wanted to penetrate into the heart of somebody. And, and like, they're supposed to ask, like, why am I doing it this way? Can they not tell how ridiculous they look? Why, why do you come, like, he says, day after day, I sat in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. If you wanted to arrest me, why didn't you do it? Like, why, why didn't you just come get me? Well, we know why. We were told back in verse 4. They plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. The word stealth is dishonest. <laughs> they, wanted, they, they, they were being dishonest with it all. Verse 5, we didn't read, says, but they said nothing during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Like, they were all concerned about what the people would think. And probably they were somewhat concerned about Rome, right? If an uproar among the people takes place, then, then Rome's going to come in. Some actually even suggested that among the big crowd that came out were some Roman soldiers who were there basically to make sure that the Jews didn't get carried away and kill an, an innocent man. Like what you have here is you have the situation where even the Roman authorities have a better understanding of right and wrong than the Jewish religious leaders of the day. Jesus has done nothing wrong. He sat in their temples. He taught. He didn't fight. He wasn't drawing swords. He wasn't killing people. He was just teaching people the way of God. They snuck out at night with clubs and swords, a crowd, a multitude, to arrest an innocent man. And they claim to be doing the will of God. Verse 56 says, but all this has taken place so that the scripture of the prophet might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Like that's interesting to me also is that obviously, and, and we know that Jesus did a lot of this and, and all this stuff that takes place. Like this is, this is all prophesied about. Like this is, this is all stuff that we knew was going to happen because this is what the prophets talked about, this happening. One of the saddest things, and then I mentioned, you know, one of the sadder verses is that Jesus said of Judas, uh, you know, um, it had been good for that man had he never been born. But, but right here at the end of verse 56 is a pretty sad verse also says, then all the disciples left him and fled. You know, this is not the defining moment for these disciples. You got one of them who betrays Jesus. Uh, we know, and we'll read about one of them denying Jesus. Um, Thomas, uh, here recently, will get his name, the doubter, right? Because he doubts the resurrection of Jesus. And yet what's interesting is that while, while we remember the events of Judas and, and Peter and Thomas, you know, they weren't alone in this. And I always try to say, man, I, certainly they're not portrayed in a positive light. 
I'm, I'm always reluctant to like point a finger of blame at them and, and, and just like lamb blast them because until I'm in their shoes, right? I mean, it's, 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 I like to think that I would stand right by the side of Jesus the whole time. And I'll be honest, I think I would. And, and I, I think I would because what I have is what they don't yet have. And I think that's a better understanding. These men were confused. Like we see that all throughout this. They were not expecting their master to be killed. They were not expecting him to be crucified. When they thought, they thought Jesus would fight right along beside him. And yet when Peter was willing to fight and die for the Lord, he was rebuked for doing so. I don't think he knew what he was doing. I think he was afraid. I think he was confused. And, and yet what we know about him is this. And I've, I've always loved this. You have two apostles here, right? And, and really a whole 11 and, and one. And, and they all act in ways they shouldn't act. But only one of them is it said it'd be better had he not been born. Because the others came to understand. The others changed. The others repented. The others refocused and committed their lives again. And, and I love that because it, 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 like we all have moments where we do what, like I'm, I'm thankful Scripture isn't recorded of my life, and for thousands of years, people are reading about the things that I've done. But, but what I know is true of these men is that they were good men, and, and they were godly men, and they're men who wanted to do right and eventually would do right. Um, and so uh, he was betrayed. Uh, we'll read uh, next week is, is actually talking more about some of the trial and then the crucifixion itself. Uh, and so we'll talk about that next week. Um, and, and we'll go ahead and draw this class to a close. If there's anyone in here tonight who needs our prayers, if there's anyone that, that we could study with or baptize, or if there's anything we could do tonight to help anybody, we would give you this opportunity uh, to, to make yourself known. Sit on one of the front rows while we stand and sing this invitation song. With sorrow and care. Brother Garrett, you did a fine job going through 56 verses. We'll sing one final song before we're dismissed in prayer. We look forward to seeing everyone with us again on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for our worship and Bible class to follow. Sing 621, the first and fourth verses.
Would you bow with me? Our dear Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. As we approach our throne of grace, Father, we thank you so much for all the many blessings of life that you bestow upon us, Father. We thank you most importantly for your son, Jesus, and the great sacrifice that was made out for all of mankind. That promises that were made were promises kept, and we're very thankful for that, Father. That through his death, we may have life eternal as long as we remain faithful to thee, Father. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity in the midweek to come and study thy word, to hear the great story and wonderful message of the gospel of Christ and his life, Father. That through his example of being tempted by the devil, we overcame that temptation by your word, Father, that, he, that is given to us. And the example for us that it sets for us when we're put into temptation, Father, that we would look to your word for comfort and guidance. And the fact that Christ died and did not call 10,000 angels and died alone, he died for all of us, Father. And we appreciate that and we're thankful for that. Father, we know that we stumble in life, that we, that we do sin, Father. We pray that you would forgive us of those sins and those trespasses when we do those things, Father. And that we would forgive ourselves when we repent. That we would help to be an example to others. That we would do the first and greatest commandment, which is to spread thy word to others that are lost. And Father, I pray that we would have strength each time that we meet people. That we would speak shamelessly about Jesus Christ and his teachings. And give us faith and courage to know that you will give the increase. Father, we're so thankful for the church that meets here at Southern Hills and the standard that they set, Father, that you've given us through your word, that the pattern that we practice is the pattern that we find in the New Testament, Father. And we're thankful for the elders and their wisdom and overseeing this congregation. We thank you for Garrett and his good family and the fact that he comes up and spreads the gospel and teaches us so easily an understandable way that helps us to become better and more faithful Christians to thee. Father, we pray that you'd beat those who are sick and afflicted. We know that our world is in great need right now of those prayers, Father, that, you would, that we would humble ourselves before you and give you the grace and honor that is so due you, Father, and that would, you would help us to overcome the, the, the tragedies that we see in our lives, Father. But we may also understand and see the certainty of death that comes to all, but the certainty, uh, the uncertainty of death, but the certainty of life that we get, Father, through your Son. We pray that we'd always keep our minds focused on Thee and on the cross. For it is in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen.